So I am here to introduce uh, our final panel of the day. I'm really particularly excited about this. We talked so much today about consumer empowerment, about consumer expectations, about getting signals from them, um, the different lovers, levers and um, laws that can impact folks' everyday lives. Uh, I think ending with this panel of thought leaders from public interest and civil society is, is, is just uh, such a nice way to tie it all together. Um, a reminder that after this panel, we do have a happy hour from five to seven, um, if you're willing to stay around. Um, but I'll just go down the line and introduce folks. We have, um, starting from my right, Molly Roberts, who's an editorial writer at the Washington Post. Uh, well, this is actually not in order, so that's not Chris. <laughs> Alexandra Reeve Givens, who was president and CEO of the Senator, uh, Center for Democracy and Technology. Next, we have Zach Graves, who's executive director of the Foundation for American Innovation, and Christopher Lewis, president and CEO of Public Knowledge. Thank you all so much for joining us, and uh, I'll sit down. Great. This is working. Great. Uh, I'm Molly. I'm moderating the panel. I'm not one of the thought leaders, but I will... <laughs> I would love to start by going down the line and asking each of you just to tell me a little bit about how you and your organizations are thinking about data portability right now. You can take the floor, Alex. Sure, you make thought leaders think better. So I think you have a very valuable role to play in this. Um, so for CDT, I mean, we think about data portability as a hugely important priority for competition and also for user empowerment, um, really in a way to help users choose better products and services that work for them and enable a world that, that has more powerful user choice. We're, of course, conscious and today helped uh, uncover many of the areas that there are a lot of really complex issues to work through. One of the areas that CDT thinks about the most are the privacy dynamics of this and really how we navigate some of the tensions to make sure um, that we come up with mechanisms and processes that protect users' rights and their privacy considerations, even as we enable an easier uh, environment for portability. I think the other final observation I'll make is that for us, portability really has to be seen as one piece of the puzzle, um, and that it's absolutely fundamental that we continue to push for other mechanisms to protect people's privacies and users' rights. Um, and the reason is doing so will help create a much better enabling environment for portability to succeed. So in a world where we have stronger data privacy protections, where we have data minimization uh, in place and actually enforced, it makes it much easier to choose third parties that are going to be trusted for that uh, porting to happen. Um, and also, uh, we can really have better comfort in terms of what the dynamics are when people are choosing what to port over and in what mechanism. So we have to think about the full ecosystem of protections here um, for the portability world to kind of be the success story that we want it to be. Uh, hey, everyone. I'm Zach Graves, Executive Director of the Foundation for American Innovation. We're a right-leaning think tank working at the intersection of governance, national security, and emerging technologies policy. Uh, for a while, we've focused on uh, promoting interoperability and data portability as part of the tech regulation conversation. I think we were disappointed that it wasn't a bigger piece of the conversation that was happening in the U.S., and you know, I think it's been much more so. Uh, you know, across the pond, you know, in the EU and the UK. Um, but I'm still optimistic that this is a time that can kind of come back into the conversation on the regulatory side and also that companies, I think, are seeing the value in, in moving this forward uh, in their own private standards. I mean, our perspective is that a lot of the, the secret sauce of, of the internet was coming, emerging in an ecosystem that was open and decentralized. And empowered users to make decisions over their own data. And I think that's a key part of why this is important to the conversation. I agree with Alex that it isn't the only piece, but it is absolutely a, a necessary, even if not sufficient, component to get right. And there are a lot of you know, tensions and trade-offs between privacy and competition. And you know, it's a delicate balance that I think we have to have some regulatory humility about when we're talking about different kinds of mandates, uh, particularly given the you know, lack of uh, expertise and capacity in some parts of uh, the U.S. Uh, regulatory apparatus, which is something I spent a lot of time working on. Um, but nonetheless, we're, we're optimistic this can be, you know, a bigger part of the conversation moving forward. 
Hi, everyone. My name is Chris Lewis. I'm uh, President and CEO of Public Knowledge. Um, and uh, first of all, Public Knowledge is a, a, a nonprofit digital rights organization here in Washington, D.C., and I've uh, been around 23 years. And, and I, a lot of what my colleagues said, uh, I can say ditto. I, I just want to say it with more fervor and <laughs> urgency. Um, <laughs> uh, because uh, uh, I agree with the, the principles of why data portability is important that Alex laid out. Um, uh, and I agree with, uh, with a, a lot of what, uh, what Zach said. Uh, I, I, I'm concerned that as we look at uh, the trade-off and the balances, uh, uh, privacy and, and, and competition, uh, sometimes mentioned when we talk about portability, um, but also others, other things that are important to consumers, other things that are important to technology users and builders, um, like, say, um, uh, the, the right to have private communication. Uh, all these things are difficult to balance, and when we have uh, an ecosystem where platforms are being largely built and structured in the private sector, unlike the early underpinnings of the internet, which was decentralized uh, and created protocols that folks could build on uh, and created openness and choice, uh, that there's a profit motive involved that it can be dangerous or can, that can slow or limit the move towards what we all say we want when it comes to portability and, and even further, I would say, you know, uh, interoperability of services whenever possible. So, so uh, we, we, we agree with a lot of what we heard, but we're definitely spending our days thinking about how you can build regulations uh, that drive that forward in the marketplace and put requirements on companies uh, to build to standards, uh, but also, uh, you know, whenever possible, to build smartly, to integrate um, uh, decentralization and portability and, and uh, openness into the design of the technology so that you have an opportunity to, to be as nimble as possible as technology uh, innovates and continues to, to grow. Great. Well, thank you all so much. So I definitely want to talk about some of those trade-offs soon, but first I want to talk about something maybe even a little more basic. So you mentioned, Chris, portability and then eventually even oper interoperability. That's something I'd love to tease out a bit. All of you think in great detail about data portability. I'm comparatively more of a layman, but as I've been listening to the conversation today, I've heard data portability, I've heard interoperability, I've heard continuous real-time data portability. When you talk about data portability, what does that mean to you? What would your ideal version of quote-unquote data portability look like? Uh, any of you is welcome to answer. I'll start. I, when I think of portability, I, I think of the ability, and, and I heard folks talking about it earlier in the day, of being able to take specific pieces of information that are important to me as a technology user, uh, uh, to take it with me, to remove it from a platform, to remove it from a service, uh, and hopefully use it in other ways, uh, as opposed to interoperability, where that is just more seamless. You know, uh, Consumers love it when we can build technology uh, that just works. Um, and they don't have to think about it. Uh, so, you know, there's, there's a debate right now about uh, Apple and whether it is interoperable enough with iMessage. Uh, but, you know, uh, that's one company's system. Uh, instead of what we were able to build because of the underlying technology, with say email or SMS texting and messaging where it was designed so that no matter what company you're working with, you can use it interoperably. So, you know, I think those are the differences. And, and as you get into higher functioning, more difficult uh, platforms and services, interoperability becomes more challenging. But these things blend together. So, you know, I think when I think of portability, I think about, you know, the data that you own, maybe your database of photos or social posts, but it can also be interactions. I mean, it can, you know, be about when you take your Facebook account to some other service or if you want to move, you know, from one that actually lets you do that, like Blue Sky to another service, you know, you're also thinking about what's your social graph and maybe even like data where you comment on friends posts that may or may not be public. And so this sort of immediately raises, you know, broader questions than just your own immediate data. So there are, I think, you know, you know, the, these are these are kind of like a spectrum of things when we're thinking about them. Um, and you can also design these things as, 
you know, permissioned or permissionless when we're talking about this. You can have an API that's sort of at the whim of the company that administers it, uh, or you can have it be built on a protocol like email. So, I mean, these things, I think, have a range of different, you know, nuances that are important to get right in either a regulatory or a kind of policy context. And I guess to follow up on that, we heard from some panelists earlier about different types of models. You just mentioned some. Do any of you have a strong feeling of which models are more suitable, of which models are better for security? And also, two-part question, how prescriptive do you think any regulation should be about what models companies have to adopt to make data portable? I mean, I think it's very context specific, right? Um, and, and raises different equities. So for example, one of the things that I think about when you're navigating the privacy trans trade offs, if I want to port my health records over to another provider, that really doesn't impact anybody but me, right? It's uh, obviously I want there to be strong security protections, strong privacy protections, but it doesn't bring in other people in my social graph. When you move into the social media space, it's a far more complex and nuanced conversation for all of the reasons that Zach was laying out, because my decision to move over a series of conversations, of course, naturally impacts the person with who that conversation is, uh, has been held, or the, you know, the personal information, the name, the, the contact information for my contacts if I choose to move those over. So I think regulation needs to be uh, nuanced in that manner. I don't think there's a one-size-fits-all. The types of considerations, though, user empowerment, privacy, security, can run through. And so that's an area where um, I think we can have consistent principles and values that the companies need to abide by while still leaving room for regulators and more individual um, kind of inactions to work through some of those details. Another issue, I think, is you, you see real kind of fundamental values differences between different regulatory domains. Like the EU traditionally puts privacy above free speech, whereas in the US we have very strong free speech norms. And so when those values come into conflict, I mean, different jurisdictions are going to take different approaches. And those are you know, very fundamental things that I think is important to have you know, some amount of democratic input on, uh, you know, if we're making a one-size-fits-all regulation, I think that can be tricky. Yeah, I, I agree. I don't think one-size-fits-all works. There's just so many different types of platforms and services these days. Um, that's why I think, you know, it's important that we have uh, expertise in the government, um, preferably at a, an expert digital regulator that could actually uh, keep up with the pace of innovation, keep up with the nuances of the different types of services, uh, and have the sort of humility that, that Zach was talking about. So this idea of an independent regulator, a new regulator, a new agency, I'm curious how that strikes the two of you as well, Zach and Alex. You gonna make me pick a fight with Chris first? <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll, I'll go here. Oh, well, no, you, can't let me, you can't let me say that and then not give me the mic to actually do it and explain that it is not picking a fight. Um, I. <laughs> Um, I deeply value and respect, in particular, the work that Public Knowledge and others have been doing on the, on the push for a single regulatory agency. I will say that for my own personal take, and I think within CDT, we think that conversation is important, but also the political realities of where we are today means that we have to keep up the pressure on the existing structures that we have. Um, and also that oftentimes these conversations are pretty nuanced and relevant to a particular sector. So for example, we can stick with health records and the portability there. There is a specific set of stakeholders and subject matter experts, separate and apart from their tech chops, who need to be involved in that conversation and the values and equities of the community of stakeholders that engage with the health regulators are probably best situated to help ground that conversation. So to my mind, the, the piece that we need to solve is how we empower those different subject matter verticals across the federal government to benefit from shared expertise, to have sufficient staffing and expertise to meet the moment, and to have elements of consistency while still being able to speak to their relevant regulated sectors in their specific areas of jurisdiction. So I personally have been more motivated and interested by how you empower tech teams within various agencies and departments, how you, do cent you leverage centralized services, whether it's the General Services Administration, the US Digital Service, the Presidential Innovation Fellows Program, OTA within, um, uh, within Congress, which Zach has long advocated for, the Office of Technology Assessment, how you leverage those centralized resources to push out skills and help consistency across the agencies while still making sure that the relevant subject matter verticals are engaging with their regulated sectors and stakeholder communities effectively. 
Yeah, I mean, to that, to that point, I mean, like, expertise lives in different places in government. It has different functions in different places, whether that's a congressional committee or a regulatory agency or a nonpartisan uh, expert advisory body. Uh, and I think those are all important. I think, you know, we also have, if you're running a social media company or an online service, you know, you're already subject to half a dozen or more different regulatory agencies that have one piece of jurisdiction. And so, I mean, I don't know that we're, we're, we're needing another one unless we're talking about consolidating the, the jurisdiction, you know, perhaps. But what I think is a prerequisite to that is sorting out these sort of fundamental problems, uh, you know, in the ability of government to build sort of the right incentives and expertise and capacities, which uh, Alex alluded to. Uh, you know, we don't have, you know, the right digital infrastructure and we don't pay, uh, uh, you know, civil service enough, uh, particularly in, you know, domains like the FTC. Some places uh, like the SEC have, you know, higher than GS scale salaries that can recruit talent, but we're talking about you know, recruiting top machine learning talent you know, paying, you know, a GS-13 or something, it's just not going to cut it. You can make way more than that right out of Stanford, you know, and go into one of the companies. So we're not, you know, really able, I think, to build that bench of capacity. And I think we've also seen, uh, you know, some of the risks of just how much everything has gotten politicized with, you know, what's going on at the FTC lately, what's going on in Congress. I think there are some more fundamental incentives we need to address before we think about, like, how to build the right bureaucracy that can tackle this. We have a lot of problems within the existing ones to maybe consider fixing. And I think a lot can be done by just sort of taking a close look at reauthorizing some of the existing authorities and fine tuning them to you know, some of these specific problems. Yeah, go do, ahead, do you, you guys are making my job easy. Do you yeah. wanna keep go, doing go. it? We can keep doing it. Um, I think Zach and Alex's examples show exactly why we need the sort of agency that I'm talking about. Uh, an expert regulator, first of all, does not have to consolidate power from other silos of policy. Um, in fact, it can reinforce it. The public doesn't delineate much between this agency or that agency. They care if there's someone on the cop, a cop on the beat doing the work. And that's the difference between a U.S. digital service, uh, you know, some of the other groups that, that Alex names that they don't have teeth. They have great expertise, uh, and a lot of us rely on that expertise. But until you can make an industry uh, actually come to the table and look at standard setting, uh, and then say you will enforce this, uh, then it's very difficult to have the sort of work on data portability and interoperability move at the pace of, of, of innovation. Uh, we saw this in the telecom sector, uh, the, the, uh, the ability to attach devices to the telephone network uh, in Carter phone, uh, literally the standardization of, of phone jacks was mandated by the Federal Communications Commission because they had the teeth to do so. And yes, there were also other actions going on in the courts uh, to try to make sure that there was not monopolization of that network, but, but it takes both to get there. And uh, no one would ever say that the FCC doesn't have the expertise in, in phone networks. They really do, and they built it over time. So. I think if you have uh, an agency with that expertise that respects uh, the other silos of work uh, since all of our lives, you know, healthcare, uh, Alex alluded to, you know, uh, and others are living online, uh, then it can really contribute to the conversation in a way that moves things faster. And last thing I'll say is that it can also balance uh, the different values that we care about. And Zach talked about free expression, very important to us. I know it's important to CDT. Um, imagine if an agency had a mandate in its charter to balance these values of free expression, to balance the values of free expression with competition and with privacy, but with the expertise around these platforms, I think it would be fantastic. And they could do the work that isn't just regulatory in the way people think about rules and enforcement, but also supporting the research that, uh, that grows with the industry. So I think, I mean, you alluded to a really important example, which I think is the most probably successful example of, of, of portability, uh, which is phone number portability in the telecom world. Uh, and, you know, I think there are a lot of good case studies there. I think, you know, we probably disagree about this, but there's also a lot of case studies on the other side where, you know, a little bit uh, overzealous regulation, you know, kept out a lot of innovation for a long time. Uh, and so it cuts both ways. And... I feel like what I heard is that we need more authorities to do particular policy goals, not necessarily a case for 
creating a separate agency? Like, I mean, do you think like there's different ways to get there for sure? What what is none of the agencies right now with expertise have enforcement power beyond you know reactive enforcement power. They don't can't set rules and then say live up to them. So so yeah, I definitely want more accountability metrics. And I do think one of the key themes here, you, you mentioned that the FTC is challenged, and you're, you're saying it's by politicization. I would say it's actually a very, very small agency that is suddenly tasked with an unbelievable enforcement challenge when you look at the scope uh, of issues that it has to grapple with and how widely and pervasive data practices are across our economy. That The scale issue, there's been a systematic attack on the FTC's enforcement powers that make it incredibly hard for them to actually have effective remedies that, that sufficiently shape corporate behavior. Um, so in any conversation, yes, we can talk about new bodies, but we also have to talk about how to sufficiently resource the existing ones. And the FTC, I think, is a critical example of one where, my God, are we falling short in terms of that? And we've, you know, uh, created way too many barriers on a really, really important cop on the beat. But we just gave them a 30% appropriations increase. And has it meaningfully scaled up with those resources? I, my impression is that they have the money this year? Yeah, yeah. All right, let's give them a little yeah. time. I mean... <laughs> Okay, let's move on to the trade-offs. And <laughs> I'm sorry, that was really snarky, Zach. We are, we are all friends up here. We, we know each other for a long time. I'm just, I'm just saying they've had a pretty bad record in court lately. <laughs> so we'll talk about the trade-offs. The, the kind of two main areas that I've heard discussed today are privacy and competition. And I know, Alex, that you mentioned privacy in particular being a big focus for you and CDT. So I was just wondering if you could run us through what some of those trade-offs with privacy or security might be and kind of what we would need to overcome them. Well, I think it's important to have a little bit of nuance in this answer, right? Because in theory, privacy and competition should not be uh, intention. In theory, more competition actually allows people to opt into more privacy-protecting services, allows people uh, to move to services that you know vote with their feet, that they respect more, and that they think is going to do a better job by them. Um, at the same time, however, as we think about data portability and some of the mechanisms involved, as I was alluding to earlier, it does raise some challenging questions for what is the data that can move over, what are the controls about those data choices, and how do we make sure that users are able to make those choices in an informed way without just completely overloading them with you know, requests and opt-ins and you know, every single thing when every time your friend wants to, to port a conversation with you over to a new platform. So those are just, they're, they're, uh, those are very nitty gritty implementation questions that this community, and I mean literally this community in the room and those online, need to have a stake uh, in the conversation and work through together. Um, the other piece, you know, sometimes I, I do think we have to be careful because sometimes this is posited as, as, a, as a false binary with privacy used as an excuse just to block efforts at portability. And we have to be really careful about that frame as well, right? You can have safeguards and allow companies in some instances, if they think that a port over is going to raise such sufficient security or privacy concerns, we can make sure that there are regulations and processes around that so they're not weaponizing the argument of privacy as a reason to block um, these pro-competitive efforts. Um, so I, I feel like that's something we can talk through, um, but, but again, requires a little bit of nuance in the conversation. Yeah, I think we need to err on the side of letting people vote with their feet. I think, as Alex said, is exactly right. There's been a lot of instances, particularly recently, where uh, companies who have a you know financial interest in you know, putting up barriers, uh, have used security and privacy as an excuse, often not very well founded. And I think, you know, if we're going to, to err on one side or the other of privacy or competition, we should, you know, almost always err on the side of competition. Sorry, not to reclaim the mic for a minute, but again, this is why a privacy law matters, right? Because if you create a more safe and secure environment, then those arguments of, well, we can't authorize this transfer to a third party because of the privacy and security vulnerabilities, that would help mitigate those concerns. So again, it's why we have to think about this in a comprehensive way. And giving companies a liability protection uh, to be able to make space to do that. Yeah, I, I agree. The importance of a privacy law to set that baseline is truly important because, uh, it, again, the consumer feels powerless. And, and those baseline rules, especially uh, you know, uh, the ADPPA 
uh, uh, bill proposal uh, that had great bipartisan support last Congress that focused on data minimization that goes a whole step further than what we see in the CCPA. Um, you know, really protects folks in a way that then they, you know, it's baked into the system and it sets guardrails for companies so that they build to those privacy standards. And then promoting competition on top of that so that we're, we're building a, a tech sector that is in line with our values uh, by having that sort of baseline privacy law, I think is uh, incredibly important. And, and you know, uh, then you can look at the trade-offs. Uh, 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 I know I'm the only one up here who wants a, an expert regulator for digital platforms, uh, but the idea that also that you're balancing these values, um, if there are trade-offs because of how the technology works is something that I would hope an agency could could at least investigate and potentially address or at least give reports out to policymakers so they can think about those balances. Yeah, no, I mean, it makes a lot of sense to me that data portability has been included in privacy legislation and could be built on top of privacy legislation, which is effectively what's happening with it being built on top of GDPR. I guess my question is, given... I don't even know when it was that I first started being told that there was great bipartisan support for this privacy bill and it was going to happen, but it was several years ago. Given nothing has happened, does that... 52 to 3 was the vote? In the... <laughs> yeah. I mean, let's be real. A whole entire delegation helped block that. The state of California made sure it didn't come to a vote in the House. And that's a shame because it had great bipartisan support outside of that state. So uh, there are details that need to be addressed to help folks, you know, come to agreement on it, but there was a lot of agreement you know, from both parties. Yeah, no, no, I mean, and yes, and I think it would be great if California hadn't done that, and I think it would be great if going forward they passed the bill, and I think it would be great if data portability were included. I guess my question is, I want to kind of get a better sense from you of what you feel the political appetite is right now for the data portability issue, either independently or as part of a larger privacy package. So, of course, there's been an independent effort, the Access Act, which also was bipartisan. Um, for the most part, we have seen this folded into the privacy conversation. I think partly that's just a congressional bandwidth issue. Small kind of, you know, one-off bills tend to not get as much momentum, particularly when they're just these big, big problems um, facing Congress for them to grapple with. I will say, though, so number one on ADPPA, it did have very strong bipartisan support, and we need to own that, and, and Chris is right to, to, to point that out. The other piece is what we're seeing in the states right now, you know. <clears throat> When you look at the number of states that, again, are passing privacy legislation, data portability and individual rights are, like, they're kind of table stakes for that conversation, um, which, again, I think shows widespread buy-in for the concept. Now, the trick is how to make the promise of that legislative language real, and that, I think, is one of the overwhelming themes coming out of the conversation today. It's one thing to say that users have this right, but what do the regulators, what do the policymakers actually mean? Are the regulatory agencies actually focused on this part of the privacy bills? Are users actually exercising those rights? and realizing the potential that is in there. And that's where I think, again, our community has a lot of work to do and organizations like DTI have work to do, helping make good on that promise so that it actually, we get the benefits of the legislative language that's there. Great. So I guess you, we mentioned a little bit the states moving on this. I'd love to hear what you make of state efforts. I know New York is the kind of biggest, buzziest one, but is there anything else in states we should be paying attention to? And also, if states started to move on data portability in the absence of federal regulation, would that be a problem? Would that be good? How, how would you view it? You know, I am really grateful for the states that are acting. I think we heard in, in uh, the lightning talk that was right ahead of us about the challenges that that brings when you only have action at the state level of, uh, you know, kudos to Consumer Reports for the app that they built. It was really great hearing that presentation and, and that, that some folks are trying to figure out, well, what state do you live in to make the thing work? A, a federal law for, a, you know, let's be real, is a, is a global network of networks, uh, I think would be more more appropriate. And so, you know, taking what the states are doing and taking what's strong and learning from it and then shoving it through the challenge that is policy making in Washington, D.C. would be the ideal situation. Yeah, I, I, I fully agree that a national law would be far superior. And I think a lot of people in our community are used to working, you know, either with Congress or with large states like California, which, 
you know, it, it has a different political alignment and maybe more things are possible, but is like similarly professionalized, has lots of staff and expert advisors and regulatory agencies. Uh, but I think, you know, it's easy to forget that, you know, many states have very poorly resourced part-time legislatures that do not really have the expertise to work through all the details. Many are also very beholden to particular, uh, you know, niche special interests. So I think it's, you know, a pretty dangerous thing once you get outside the coasts and once you start looking at, you know, all the different conflicting standards that might arise and what the compliance burden of that could be. The way I look at this is we have to look at what's happening in the states as evidence of the groundswell of public opinion on privacy issues, the fact that people do want better protections, they do want better protections for their rights, and they want more control. And we have to use that as the mandate to resurrect energy at the federal level and get the type of uniform national law that's really going to put users first. And I'll just add, I mean, I, you mentioned the Access Act. I think that's a really good starting vehicle. I, I wish it got more attention in the conversation. I think a lot of the air was sucked out of the room by some of the other antitrust vehicles that, that ultimately failed. Um, but I think it would be a really good time to bring back that conversation. Great. Well, because it's become kind of a meme today, I thought I would bring up AI and <laughs> ask all of you how AI has made you think, if at all, differently about data portability, what concerns or just new things to consider it's brought up for you. Um, you can take this conversation in two different directions. So I was trying to choose which one to go with um, and remove the, uh, you know, the afternoon cynicism of, oh gosh, yes, AI is not just a meme today in this room. Um, so you know, there are a couple different um, points to have here. One is that as the economy um, continues to move in a direction that really strongly kind of privileges and is built on systems that rely on massive amounts of data to train them, data portability and interoperability is going to be more important than ever to help address competition issues, to help democratize these systems, to help give access to other platforms and other companies that are emergent in the space. So I think the competition mandate for portability and interoperability approaches gets stronger than ever as AI systems continue to go into the ascendancy. Two, Cornelia made a beautiful presentation about the potential ways in which AI systems and AI agents can, and, and, and Suki built on this, can help empower users to better exercise their rights. Um, so as I was watching the great uh, presentation from Consumer Reports and hearing what they're doing, one of the things in the back of my mind was the number of kind of niche but emerging uh, tools that people are using for generative AI to help generate complaints or form letters for them to exercise their rights in courts or vis-a-vis -a, -vis a company. Um, and there are ways is, you know, it, it, it's kind of small potatoes compared to some of the other bigger stakes AI conversations, but there are ways in which AI can be used as a tool for, for users to better exercise their rights and represent their interests when faced with the wild onslaught of different companies that they're engaging with over the course of any one day. And I really hope that it's not just Consumer Reports, but other organizations lean into that narrative and those opportunities as well. Yeah, I'll just say that, I, I, you know, what we talked about at the beginning of this panel was the sort of you know, pendulum swinging between the sort of early open web, decentralized web, and the sort of walled gardens of your, your AOLs and your platforms. And I think AI is absolutely a centralizing force. And so thinking early about what the regulatory framework for, you know, inter interoperability might be, I think could empower users, even if it's not regulating and acting on the AI companies themselves, you know, freeing users up to sort of have their data, uh, you know, be able to be used in different ways by different uh, services, I think will be really powerful. Yeah. Uh, we're, the, the good news is that we're early on in this conversation about AI. And so, um, again, we can try to build uh, the technology. And if we can't build the technology, build regulations to drive in the direction that everyone's talking about. So, you know, the... the uh, the, the two major gatekeepers that folks are looking at right now with AI is uh, the large data and the data sets, as well as the ability to process and compute and build models. And so uh, we're, we're very excited about uh, continuing to study and contribute to the conversation about uh, building uh, 
ideally public, a public AI option, uh, but even uh, the conversation that the NTIA has started on, on open data models, uh, I know CDT has helped uh, support uh, civil society getting engaged and thank you for your work on that, uh, is incredibly important uh, because we're just trying to figure out now if it's something that can be a reality and, and like Zach said, build it into the underlying technology. Um, but, but if we can, uh, I think it can really promote both uh, values in the the models uh, that we want to promote, uh, whether it's you know fighting bias and discrimination or any competitive practices or other things, uh, uh, as well as to provide options for folks uh, to have uh, a baseline option uh, to access uh, generative AI and, and this exciting new technology. So there's a lot of work to do there. I don't, I don't know if it's possible, but given what we've seen with other technologies, uh, you know, early internet and other uh, other technologies where we were able to build it in, I think it's a, the right goal. And, and what I want to see is the government, hopefully NTIA is the start of this, the government taking a role in trying to build it. Um, again, when it is only being built in the private sector, uh, then they can speak to these values, but they always have an additional value involved, which is to look for ways to close off the marketplace and uh, and move towards monopoly or, or dominance. And, and that's not in the public interest in the long run. All right, well, I had one more question before we open it up to Q&A. But before that, I wanted to make sure that there's nothing that any of you were burning to talk about that I did not ask about. It's actually, it's eating me that it sounds like I'm against your proposal for a new agency. So here on the record, I am going to confirm that I'm not against it at all. It's just a al resource allocation question. So as an advocate myself, I am focused on other priorities, but I fully support public knowledge's efforts and the fact that you are pushing the conversation in this way. Conscious clear, I feel better. Thank you. <laughs> Look at us coming together here. Zach, you wanna? No, I'm no. against it. I think it's a terrible idea. We have too much bureaucracy. <laughs> Uh, I, I will say, I, 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 I've been arguing fervently for my position here. And I, I am really grateful. <laughs> we really are friends. I really like these guys. I, I am really grateful to DTI for hosting this conversation. It's really needed. And the fact that they're, um, yes, working with industry, but coming at it from a nonprofit perspective and trying to figure out the right way to make data portability work. Is, is what I'm talking about. And I, I just wish there were, you know, we're, we're all nonprofits here, you know, it's a small uh, uh, budgets that we all have in civil society. And, and, and the power of the government to drive this conversation towards these values, I think is just great. All right, so final question. Just was there anything today you learned that was new to you or that really stuck out to you and think is gonna change the way that you think about any of this going forward? I was really excited to hear the progress that um, Consumer Reports Permission Slip is making. I remember when that was a nascent idea. I remember Suki is a former CDTer, and I remember when she left us to go do this really important work. Um, it's amazing to see the, the progress, and this is the exact type of experimentation and creation of user empowerment tools that we need. We just we need them to be better resourced. We need there to be more of them. Um, but that type of work, and then <clears throat> as a policy advocate, how we create a policy environment that helps support the compliance functions to allow those tools to succeed is really important. So it stuck with me when she said, you know, California and Colorado have given them the hooks, but the other privacy bells have kind of passed them by. Um, and it just reminds me how much it's important that in the policy fight, we are also talking to the implementers and the people that can prototype, and DTI is one of them, to make sure that the asks are aligned and we're creating a policy environment that can allow these types of tools and pilots to, to really succeed. Yeah, I'll second that. I, I think, you know, uh, something I first heard of uh, and just downloaded and look forward to checking out. You know, tools like this have been really important in the privacy space more generally, and there has been a strong I think, role of, of both philanthropy and, and the public sector through entities like the Open Technology Fund, you know, and piloting really cool, fun, you know, stuff we all use like Tor and Signal and, you know, VPNs. And I think, like, there is a really important role of sort of interchange between like private and public and philanthropy on like making sure that these things are are built and you know I think there's a you know wide open field here for for more kind of work like that. 
Um, you know, I really appreciated, uh, I, I caught the tail end of the panel, um, uh, Joe Jerome and others were on talking about uh, different types of data portability and, and to hear them talk about it in like, oh, uh, you know, uh, avatars and, you know, other, other small pieces of data and making that work uh, was really helpful for me as someone who's like pushing forward, like, how do we get to interoperability? Uh, but but if we really want experts to help us design how to do this, we have to take the small bits and then learn from it. And so it was, I thought it was a great conversation about where we're seeing success and so that we can learn from it and move to the harder uh, types of, of portability and interoperability in the future. So that and, and, and Alex's kind remarks that she doesn't fully disagree with me, so. <laughs> Terrific, well, thank you all so much and I'll open it up now to anyone else who wants to ask a question. Two over there. Thanks. Hi. Thank you so much for the great, uh, great panel. My name is Tate Ryan Mosley. Um, I am. I actually am wondering if we can speak a little bit on the geopolitics side here. I realize this has been kind of U.S. focused, but I'm curious about how you think this space between data controls, data sharing, um, and geopolitics might evolve in the next one year, five years. Um, I think there's been a little bit more activity that we're seeing, the executive order yesterday, obviously, but um, like, how, do, how will this change and how might changes in the geopolitical space impact downstream users and user ownership over, over their data in the long run? Well, for one thing, it seems like the EU has bilateral uh, relations with California now, so <laughs> I guess they're doing more than Congress. Um, I, I think of it in a I start with the, the idea that if we both want to be a leader in industry and if we want to be a leader in setting the values that we build technology to, we need to be in. We need to be leading in the policymaking, and for years we have not. Uh, you know, California and Europe have, but not the full United States. Um, I think most people agree we don't want the surveillance state that is China and, and other parts of the world. And so, if we uh, if we want to lead, we need efforts like DTI's efforts. We need uh, industry efforts. But I would love to see the power of the government get behind getting some initial regulations, even if they go a hair too far, you can roll those, you can, you can recalibrate if you have nimble expertise and agencies doing that work, whether it's the, at the FTC or elsewhere. Um, so uh, I think getting in the game is the most important thing because then you can shape uh, what the standards are uh, and where, where the technology is going. Um, it, you know, setting the standards just feels so important. Uh, so that's where I start. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's not my area of expertise, but I think you do have all, all the sort of trend of, of data localization laws, and I'm sure that will create some really interesting wrinkles in trying to roll out these standards, particularly out of the, like, liberal Western democracies. And I think we had another question over there. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Xander Arneo. Um, I'm a former DTIer, actually. I, I, worked, I interned with Chris and Delara last summer, so big fan of data portability. Um, I want to ask a question about digital regulator. Um, it's an issue I've been thinking about a, a, for a while. I'm a strong supporter. I think it's great. I love the work that public knowledge is doing on the issue. Um, I guess my, my question, is, so my question is for you, Chris. Um, one, one of the big concerns historically about independent regulators is capture, right? Like you, you, your, your example with AT&T, right? Like AT&T had a government sanctioned monopoly for what, almost 50 years, more than that, right? I guess so I'd love to hear a little bit about how you're thinking about that issue. How do you create a, a digital regulator, right, who's whose clients who are servicing, like just regulating one particular sector, how do you insulate them from that influence? How do you make sure that their incentives are aligned with the publics and not the industries? I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, it's not easy is the short answer. Um, but I think it's worth fighting for because the alternative is self-regulation by industry. Um, uh, the, the, the few rules that we do have or right now with a little bit of enforcement on the back end that quite frankly sometimes doesn't even work even though we support it when, when, when the government does take folks to court. So uh, I think you have to fight for that sort of agency with the culture that uh, has uh, all stakeholders at the table. Um, yeah, the, the FCC is not perfect. That's my background. I started at the FCC when I started in tech policy and uh, there are some uh, regulations at the FCC where uh, they 
the law does not have uh, an automatic enforcement mechanism when there's a complaint coming in, and then there's some that do. So writing those laws correctly is important when you empower an agency. Um, setting up, you know, uh, things like uh, APA rulemaking proceedings. So if you're if you're giving an agency the power to make specific rules and be nuanced, like we're talking about, um, then uh, you need to uh, have a rulemaking proceeding where everyone can be involved in the process and there's a record and people can respond to it. And so when something is really important, civil society groups have a fighting chance to play in, in that space. And we've seen that at the FCC over the last couple of decades on very important issues. Um, but, but you're right, that agency started out with an agreement in the Kingsbury Commitment 100 years ago where the industry said, we will build this network for you if you give us uh, basically a, a, a government sanctioned monopoly. And we learned the good and the bad of that. And competition, the push that we saw in the 70s and 80s to break, up, break it up, which happened in the courts and in Congress and at the FCC, it was a joint effort. Uh, we've got a paper on it if folks want to read it. Um, uh, the competition that we were driving for in, in those decades, 70s, 80s, and 90s, I think is the more ideal situation we want to be in. So can you start with a culture of promoting competition in the mandate, in the charter for an agency? You know, that's why people talk about, you know, can you start a digital regulator by building it into the Federal Trade Commission? Because they already have that culture of promoting competition. I don't think it's an either or of FTC and another agency. Uh, the FTC and the FCC already work in concert on a lot of issues. I think it can be accomplished if you build that culture in from the start. So I still think it's a terrible idea, but here's how I would do it if I was going to do it. Uh, first, uh, you know, this is a little bit of a double-edged sword because you need some of the expertise, but revolving door restrictions would be one that's a big problem with the FTC. Uh, salary and compensation level needs to be way higher. Uh, and then if I was really committed to this idea, I'd look at how the CFPB is structured without an annual appropriation uh, or it gets direct fund from the Treasury subject of a Supreme Court case right now. It should be fun, but I think they'll be fine. Um, and so like giving an insulation from political scrutiny for going hard on uh, industry, you know, so that's how I would do it. I still think it's a terrible idea. But, but these are good suggestions. I mean, the, <laughs> the independence of the Federal Communications Commission is important, uh, and, and it has led to better policymaking, I believe. Any more questions? All right, that's it. Well, thank you so much. I'm glad you're all still friends. Thank you so much.